And I am a social scientist in the Music Cognition Lab, and on behalf of everyone here, we are just thrilled that you are all joining us. Welcome to Resonant Voices. Our title, Resonant Voices, evokes our feelings about the scope of our work, that it is deep and clear with reverberations that are wide reaching and that through the combined impact of our voices and research, we can truly change the health of our communities through music. The field of music and health is expansive. We can in no way capture the breadth of research of our lab in a single evening. But we hope to share with you a glimpse of the meaningful work happening right here in Nashville, Music City. We hope that this event serves as the beginning of our conversation and invites you in to learn more. We're so grateful to the artists, families, and supporters that are with us tonight, and I'd love to kick off the evening by inviting Dr. Raina Gordon and Dr. Miriam Lenz, the co-directors of the Music Cognition Lab, to the stage to tell you more about the mission of the lab. So join me in welcoming them. Hi everybody, thank you so much for being here and for joining us for what's going to be just an incredible night of music and community and I've got like goosebumps already. Uh, so the mission of the Vanderbilt Music Cognition Lab is to discover how human musicality, which is how we interact and engage with music from our genes, through our brains, through our behavior, and how this is fundamentally intertwined with our health, our wellness, and our development. And this mission is formed by our premise that musicality is an essential part of being human and that we can harness music's duality as both a universal yet personalized experience to reveal both fundamental biological functions of music as well as for the design and implementation of music-based health interventions. And we advance this music through collaborations with a very highly interdisciplinary team of what we call musician scientists and musician clinicians. So tonight, you'll get to hear examples of our lab programs with performance from our, performances from our incredible guest musicians, but also with members of our lab team who are both scientists and musicians. So we wanted to start with a brief vi uh, video to give you a little bit of an overview about the lab, um, and then we'll be back for some more remarks and music. Music is just an incredibly powerful art form, but it's also a way of interacting with other people. Musicality is coded in our genomes. Sometimes we know that it changes the way that we feel. We know that making music can be a way to cope. And there's a relationship with health. One way we currently are studying this is by using eye tracking technology. If song and music can be helpful for supporting social interactions, can we then embed that in different types of therapeutic activities? Where is the girl standing? We want to look at whether there are associations between rhythm skills and language skills within families. One of the ways that we do that is through rhythm perception tests. My name is Kate. I'm a music therapist in the Nashville area. One of the um, things the that Dr. Lenz is doing is a songwriting intervention for parents of children with autism. Through some of our work with the ACM is that parents are writing their own songs, so they're getting to tell their own stories. What color are the trees? Through this program, you learn mindfulness principles and apply them through the art of songwriting. Or it could be a song that's finger-picked, so like this. The ACM gift has really allowed the lab to boost research on music and social engagement in completely new ways. We are very grateful for the ACM's you know, interest in this type of work, and that, I feel like, is a quintessential Nashville experience. As you listen, just practice that mindfulness, paying attention to this song. And no judgment. Our research is a collaboration. I have colleagues in multiple departments. Being able to work with all these people from you know different expertise. I see. And kind of put our minds together to think how can we best answer these research questions and best you know support children and families. I hear birds chirping. We're really fortunate to have this facility because it gives us a place to do our science in an environment that's very warm and welcoming. You know, this is the perfect place to do it in Music City.
haven't gotten to, some people we've only worked with virtually, so if you haven't gotten to see our Music Cognition Lab House on Music Row, we would invite you all to you know, follow up with us to get a tour. Um, so to advance our research, we primarily rely on research grant support from federal funding sources like the National Institutes of Health, the National Science Foundation, and the National Endowment for the Arts. And we're also so highly appreciative of the support we've received from community partners like the Academy of Country Music Lifting Lives Foundation, which has helped support some of the work as you heard in the video. Um, and tonight we're really here to celebrate music and health, and we're really excited to build partnerships to advance this work. And as many of the current grants wind up and come to an end, it's really time to bring in new funds to support this work. And our goal is to grow our music intervention research, such as you will hear examples of later tonight, as well as to start new work, especially focused on singing, to reveal from both a biological and a social perspective. And to to really look at the development and use of singing for wellness. So with new financial support, we will be able to expand our team to advance those types of initiatives. So we're really so grateful for all of you to be with here with, with us, to be here with us tonight to celebrate music and health. And we thank you so much for your time and your support. And we really want to encourage you also to check out the silent auction items. I've already bid it on a few things. <laughs> um, for some truly unique Nashville music and health opportunities, uh, as well as some items from local community businesses in support of advancing this mission. So we're gonna invite our Master of Ceremonies, Kelly, back up, and she's gonna introduce our first performer. Thank you. Well, tonight would not have been possible without the support and partnership of Lee Nash. Let's give it up to Lee, for Lee Nash, who's here with us tonight. Uh, we are so grateful to Lee for working with us on this event. And before I introduce her, I do want to be sure that you know tonight is going to be filled with music and stories and celebrations. And we want you to have a good time and we want you to feel comfortable. So feel free to make your way to the bar for another drink or peruse the silent auction items whenever you wish throughout the evening while being respectful, of course, to our performers and our families who are here. And we will have a short break um, before we do the second half of our show, so that'll be a chance for you to stretch your feet and take another look at stuff. But feel free to get up and get a drink at any point if you want to throughout the night. So now the world knows Lee Nash best as the delightful pixie-esque voice atop massive global hits such as Kiss Me and There She Goes with six pence none the richer, but she's worked tirelessly to define her perspective through her songwriting output showcased on her newest project, The Tide, Volume 1, a six-song collection of duets recorded with people that Lee considers personal superheroes. And Lee is a superhero for us at the lab, so please join me in welcoming her to the stage. Let's give it up for Lee. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, this, these folks are heroes to me. My first dream job was to do what precious Kate does, and you saw her in the video uh, writing songs with family. There you are. <laughs> um, and so I just, I, I find it so beautiful that all these years later, I started my career in Sixpence when I was about 16 years old, and so the dream of this kind of got usurped, but getting to, uh, to, I don't know, be involved in even any small way is such a gift, and um, I'm thankful for it, but I'll, I'll be quiet and get to the music. <laughs> Thank you. This is Tom Donovan. He's going to be playing with me. Kiss me out of the bearded valley, nightly beside the green, green grass, swing, swing, swing the spinning step. You wear those shoes, and I will wear that dress. Oh, kiss me beneath the milky twilight, lead me out on the moon. Drag up the band and make the fireflies and silver moon sparkly. So kiss me. Kiss 
kiss me down by the broken tree. I was swing me up on its hanging tie. Bring, bring, bring your flowered hat. We'll take the trail marked on your father's map. So kiss me beneath the milky twilight. Strike up the band and make the fireflies dance, silver moon sparkling. So kiss me, lie, 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 lie. lie. Well, I was gonna go for it. So. <laughs> me beneath the milky twilight lead me out on the moonlit floor lift your open head strike up the band and make the fireflies dance silver moon sparkly so kiss me Kiss me, lie, 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 lie. Thank you so much. Oh. Whoever is next, is it you or am I still on? Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. I'll be back. <laughs> Got both like super excited and then also terrified that I was supposed to come up and sing and I thought I didn't prepare anything. <laughs> and that would be horrifying for all of us. But luckily for you, um, I have written remarks. I will not be singing them, although we often talk in our studies about how you can turn anything into a song. Um, so a lot of the work that we do in our lab and the work that I lead in our lab uses music and song to investigate basic psychological processes, but also to design clinical and community-based interventions to support social development and emotional well-being in children and families. And I will admit that a lot of our work does focus on children. And in one of our studies, we had been conducting a parent-child music class, our serenade project, for families of children with and without autism. And we found that although families enrolled in the class for their children, parents were discovering, and we thought, aha, we knew it would happen, that there was a lot of benefits for the parents from having these musical experiences. Things like improving their emotion regulation, forming social connections, and also learning music-based parenting skills. So we thought for our next study, as that one was wrapping up, that we really wanted to specifically focus on how we could support parents directly to promote their mental health and well-being. And we were focused on working with parents of children with autism and other developmental differences. And really, it was very prescient of us because what a time it was to do this, um, we planned to launch this study in 2020. And as if you all remember back just a few, few years ago, 2020 was quite a year, and it became quite a year when families could really use some more support and some opportunities to develop coping and self-care skills. So in addition to being a researcher, I'm also a clinical psychologist. And so I worked with music therapist Kate Kelly, who's going to get lots of shout outs tonight, um, to design the mindfulness-based music and songwriting program through a research grant um, from the National Endowment for the Arts Research Lab program with some additional support from our department and the ACM Lifting Lives Foundation. And in this two-year project, which has now wrapped up, parents learn specific mindfulness principles like mindful awareness or paying attention in the present moment without judgment. And they then practice these skills through music-based meditations and the writing of two original songs. And to be clear, these parents did not have prior songwriting experience. Many were not musicians. They just were looking for support and help. Um, and they really learned mindfulness and they learned these principles like patience and trust and letting go and acceptance through the art of songwriting. 
Um, and also because this was done during the pandemic, the study was conducted entirely over telehealth, so some of us are meeting for the very first time in person tonight, which is extremely exciting. So supported by Kate, participants wrote two songs. Their first song focused on applying mindfulness aware mindful awareness to their child, bringing attention to their child. Uh, participants would explore memories, imagery, sensations, thoughts, and feelings that they associated with their child. And then they told the story of their child and their relationship with their child through songwriting, through crafting their own story. In their second song, participants explored themes of loving kindness or friendliness and compassion towards themselves. So for those of you who are parents out here, you know that we often spend so much of our energy focused on being a caregiver. Um, and this was an opportunity for parents to turn their kindness and their caregiving inward towards themselves, to think about the messages they needed to hear for their own care and their own wellness. Um, if you scan the QR code above, if I'm not standing right in front of it, um, you can listen later to many different songs from the program, all shared with participant permission, of course. So as you engage in uh, the music tonight, I want to encourage you to try to do mindful listening. So um, you'll notice we talked earlier that music is both universal and also personalized. And so even though these songs were crafted from very individualized, personalized experiences, I think you'll note some universal themes in them. And so I um, encourage you to let the songs resonate with you, if you will, and to be aware of your own thoughts and feelings and sensations that emerge. So I'd like to thank all the families who participated in our Mindful Songwriting program. I want to recognize Kate Kelly, the music therapist, who worked with all of the families. So. And then I particularly want to thank the parents who are allowing us to share their songs and stories with you today. So you'll be hearing songs by Elizabeth Romnus and Aaron Rapolo, who couldn't travel here tonight, but will be sharing video messages. And then we're so excited to be joined by families in person, including Tiffany Hines, and some of you already heard her song and her story, and you can also check it out online. Um, and then also we'll be hearing some additional original songs by Christopher Bunch and Rebecca Doris. And I'm just so grateful to all of you for sharing with us this evening. So with that, I'd like to invite up to stage both our next uh, performers, who include Julie Mazzone, a speech-language pathologist in our lab, and Dr. Noah Fram, who is a postdoctoral fellow in our lab, so some examples of these you know, science, musician scientists, as well as Christopher Bunch, who is going to share and introduce his own song. So please, welcome me, please join me in welcoming them to the stage. Hello, I love seeing these beautiful faces out here. My, my name is Christopher Bunch, and I, along with the wonderful Kate Kelly, wrote Lightning and Thunder. Where do I start? This, this song was such a sincere joy to, to write. I felt blessed to be part of this, this journey. Um, I can remember, you know, there's so much, so many wonderful things I could say about my son, Hal, who's the subject of, the, subject of this song. And I, I don't, I'm sure, Kate can tell you, I was bouncing around, could not sit on lyrics. She, by the time she could finish singing a line, I was like, no, change it to this. And, and so, so, you know, we had so many failed starts, you know, I was, could not get satisfied. And she said, well, why don't you just try to start over? One, two, three, and everything flowed. It all came, the nonstop, God just blessed me. And the song just flowed from me. And we were done with the first draft in 10 minutes from that point, after working on it for days on end. Um, and... This song has been a continual joy for me since then. I shared it immediately with everybody who would listen. It's like, you know, I don't know who this is, but their number's on my phone. Here, give the song a listen. <laughs> um, but, and, and uh, every time I hear it, I'm, I'm reminded about the things, some things that I love about my son. I'm reminded about this joyful experience. I'm reminded about my position, my, my relationship with my, my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It, it, this song has been a lot to me. Um, and it, I'm sure it will be on, for, for eternity on my shower sing-along playlist. So um, without further ado, Lightning and Thunder. One, 
fried the butter and the cheese. House on a hunger rampage. Here he comes, scattering at the sun, dragging leaves across his face. Superfly ninja house hiding in the corner of my room. It appears like lightning, disappears like thunder, leaves my world torn asunder. He appears like lightning, disappears like thunder, leaves my world torn asunder. Outside and he joins the song with all the singing birds. There he goes, where he's going, he don't know. But he's gonna gotta get there first. Super fly ninja house hiding in the corner of my room. He appears like lightning, disappears like thunder. My world torn asunder. He appears like lightning, disappears like thunder. Leaves my world torn asunder. He sees me and says, I love you too. Next, we're going to watch a video testimonial from the uh, participant, I'm sorry, participant that wrote our next song. Hi, my name is Erin Rapolo, and I have two kids. I have a daughter named Sophie. She is 14 and has a rare genetic condition called Williams Syndrome. And I also have a son named Barrett, who is 15 years old. And he, while doesn't have a formal um, diagnosis of autism, we do believe he is on the spectrum. So when I first learned about this mindful um, music therapy program, we were in the height of COVID. And I was uh, asked to choose between my two children of who I would like to write a mindful uh, piece of music about. I figured my son would be a perfect person for me to share my wish with him. And this song really is about um, my son, who is um, a bright, very um, responsible, smart, artistic kind, genuine young man uh, who's always had a different perspective on life and stood out a little bit to peers and to others. I wanted to write this song for him so that he could know that we celebrate all who he is, all who he has become, and that, you know, my wish is that he can see that as well because we have uh, lots of hopes and dreams my wish is that he can see those for himself as well. Participating in this uh, research, mindful uh, music songwriting research program was a um, amazing experience for me. I looked forward to every single one of my sessions. I was able to really put what I knew to practice and learn more. And I looked forward to every week. Uh, I think during a time where uh, the world was going through this national crisis of COVID. To know that every week I had this to look forward to, it really helped me get through that time. It helped me, um, not only me, but it helped me also connect with my son, who, like the song, lives in 
um, the shadows of his sister, being able to share this experience with him uh, brought us closer. And I think it also helped him during a really tough time in his life. This program was enlightening. It was fulfilling and something that I am so grateful to have been able to uh, be a participant for. I hope that many others are able to um, have a chance to participate in a program like this because I never thought of myself as a writer and being able to put my words into a song by a professional who write who you know plays guitar and and sings music was just a really cool experience it was really something that I'm grateful for and it's something that I will remember for a very long time A little boy, a little different, growing up with challenges. He sees the world just like an artist, always thinks in his own way. You may think you're in the shadow. You may think that no one cares. Wish you could see all your radiance Cause you mean so much to me This little boy became a poet Put his creativity to work He's a collector, a brother, and a friend Honest, bright, and genuine You're in the shadow You may think that no one cares Wish you could see all your radiance Cause you mean so much to me This is my wish My wish You mean so much to me to a presentation over here from one of our lab members. Um, this is Anna Kasdan. Right. I'm gonna use this microphone, which is working. Okay. So uh, switching gears a little bit, I am also not gonna sing, um, but I'm gonna talk to you about uh, studying music cognition, who and how. I'm a PhD candidate in the neuroscience program here at Vanderbilt. Um, I'm in my fifth year in my last year, um, and I'm excited to present to you about uh, kind of what we do in the broader picture of things in music cognition. So when I first entered into the field of music cognition, I was like, cool, I'm gonna study the brain and music and you know that's that's what I'm gonna study but then I quickly learned that that is many things and it's not just one thing um, so music is made up of many elements um, we have rhythm which is the focus of my work and a lot of the work in the music cognition lab um, melody timbre and lyrics uh, I thought I'd spend a moment on rhythm um, and show you one of my favorite examples so this is uh, 2008 drummers from the 2008 Beijing Olympics So there's a lot of coordination going on, right, both between the drummers and with the audience who's clapping along. Even though they don't have formal musical training, they're able to keep the beat. Um, and so that's one of the things that we're interested in studying in the lab is how uh, humans interact with musical elements. So, for example, rhythm. 
Um, and then when I talk about music here, what I'm really talking about is musicality, so the idea of how we interact with music um, and not just music as a signal. And so music is an aspect of cognition along with many other things, including, but not an exhaustive list, uh, language, memory, emotion, movement, and all of these elements of music can interact with various aspects of cognition. And they can also interact across development. So we can study these things in young children, to undergraduate students, to individuals who are older, um, and then also in individuals with various um, audiological or neurological um, disorders or diseases. So for example, individuals with uh, stroke or aphasia, developmental language disorder or dyslexia, individuals who use cochlear implants, autism, Parkinson's disease, dementia. Again, this is a non-exhaustive list. Um, and so there are different labs focused on different combinations of all of these elements, um, which is something that as an undergraduate um, many years ago I did not uh, quite realize. And so in the music cognition lab, um, we're interested in kind of a few different combinations of these elements, so specifically rhythm and language um, and how those abilities may develop um, kind of in, under normal developmental circumstances, but then also in individuals with neurodevelopmental um, differences, so for example, autism. And then I do kind of a different combination that's a little bit outside of the um, main scope, um, which is looking at the relationship between rhythm and language in individuals with post-stroke aphasia. And I do this with various methods, um, so behavioral methods and structural brain imaging methods, but there are a whole host of um, methods that we use in cognitive neuroscience to try and understand these relationships. Uh, so kind of a brief primer about aphasia. Um, it's an acquired communication disorder resulting um, from damage to language regions of the brain. Stroke is the most common cause, and that's the population that I primarily work with, but you can also get aphasia from a variety of etiologies. Um, so for example, traumatic brain injury, there are also neurodegenerative forms of the disease, primary progressive aphasia. Bruce Willis was diagnosed with that recently, um, a brain tumor. And uh, it's quite prevalent. There are over 2 million individuals in the United States who have aphasia. Um, and interestingly, for my purposes, because I'm a neuroscience PhD candidate and I like the brain, um, damage is almost always localized to the left hemisphere in post-stroke aphasia. Um, so why do we care about rhythm um, in aphasia at all? Um, and one reason is because it's used quite a lot in therapy. Um, so speech language pathologists will often use rhythm-based strategies, so for example, tapping or pacing to help facilitate speech output, to help with fluent speech, to help with pacing when reading. Um, but we don't really have a good idea of who that might benefit um, or who it works for and why. Um, but we do know something about rhythm in the brain, um, which is that it's distributed um, across both hemispheres, so left and right, um, and also includes regions that are damaged uh, frequently in post-stroke aphasia. And so how we can study this um, and how I am studying it is by asking people to do a variety of behavioral tasks. So they come in, listen to the beat of some music, tap along to the beat of some music, and then we can map that onto their brain using structural brain imaging. So for example, their MRI or CT scan from when they had their stroke. Um, and so, oops, um, the big questions I'm interested in are um, who might rhythm-based strategies be helpful for and why? Um, and to do this, we want to really understand the relationship between rhythm, language, and the brain post-stroke. Um, and with that, I'm going to hand it over to whoever is introducing Allison. <laughs> Catherine, maybe. Thank you all for joining us tonight. In just a moment, it will be my pleasure to introduce you to our next artist, Allison Moore. But first, I want to encourage you to check out the many items in our silent auction at the back of the rotunda. We'll take a short break after Allison where you can come over, say hi, bid on items, grab a drink. The silent auction bidding will close at 745, so be sure to stop by the tables and take a look. We have some amazing items from partners such as The Porch, The Nashville Symphony, Frothy Monkey, our wonderful artists, opportunities for a private songwriting or music therapy session, and much, much more. But first, let's welcome Allison Moore. Allison is a singer-songwriter. Yes, <laughs> woohoo! 
She's also a producer and author who has released 10 critically acclaimed albums. She has been nominated for Academy, Grammy, Americana Music Association, and Academy of Country Music Awards. Allison holds an MFA in creative writing from the New School. Her work has been published in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and more. She received the Hall Waters Prize for Excellence in Southern Writing in 2020. Her second memoir, I Dream He Talks to Me, was published in October 21. We are honored to have her here with us tonight. Welcome, Allison. Oh, hey, y'all. I'm just gonna put the guitar down because I'm only gonna play just a little bit. What I wanna do is just talk to you about a couple things. Um, I wrote it all down because I'm at the point in my life when I know that if I talk about my son, I'm gonna cry. If I write it down, there's less of a chance. That's all to say, bear with me. When Lee Lash texted me to ask if I'd be a part of this event, I said, of course I will. Lee is my friend, and I'd pretty much show up anywhere she asked me to go. So after I said yes, I went to the website for the Vanderbilt Music Cognition Lab. The second sentence I read was, the lab is focused on the relationship between music, language, and social development. I didn't need to read any further. Making music has made up a big portion of the work I've done in my life. It was my main focus until I had my son, John Henry, in 2010, and my priorities changed, of course. John Henry developed happily and seemingly normally until he started to lose at around 17 months of age the 25-word vocabulary that he had developed. He was finally diagnosed with level 3 autism at 23 months. He had, by that time, lost every one of his words. In 2021, I released a memoir I wrote about my life with John Henry. I'd like to read a short excerpt from one of the essays in it that depicts how, for a time, John Henry would burst into tears when he would hear me sing. The first time it happened, I had started to sing Amazing Grace while holding him in a tour bus. His father is a singer-songwriter, too. So we were confounded by his heartbreaking emotional response to some music. Um, so I'm just going to read part of this. This is from a piece called Below the Belt. He received the diagnosis the following March when he was administered the usual battery of tests that determine whether a person lands on the spectrum or not. By that time, we'd started to adjust to the reality that we'd likely be told he did. I had stopped singing in my full voice around John Henry. I would sing the baby songs, B-I-N-G-O, Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, and others that didn't require any velocity, and he didn't seem to mind. But if a song or my voice held any hint of poignancy or hit that mid-belt place, it was too much for him. I was careful not to forget myself and break into song as I had been wont to do for as long as I could remember. It was heartbreaking. I knew it wasn't about volume or pitch. It was about his becoming overwhelmed by the way my singing made him feel. If a human face is the hardest thing in the world to look at because it is so complicated and holds so much information, then the human voice must be the hardest thing to hear and make sense of for the same reasons. It all made me turn quiet. I felt as if we had lost a way to bond on top of everything else. I thought John Henry might shy away from music for his entire life. I couldn't imagine what that would be like for a person, let alone one who was born into the family that he was. I didn't know and couldn't imagine an existence without it. I struggled with his struggle, and I worried about what his father and I had passed on to him. Could it have been our faults that he was so sensitive to music? Music above all else has always given us both pathways with which to connect to the world. It has in different ways saved us. What we cannot say, we can sing. I thought it ironic that the son of two people whom music had blessed so richly was so plowed over by it. But as I got used to the idea that my son was very likely going to walk through his, this life with a different kind of filter than most, I also started to see that he had a gift. John Henry has a great sensitivity it's almost as if, as if he is missing a layer of protection against the onslaught of information 
the world can throw at you. But he slowly strengthened himself and continues to do so. I will always remember the day that I forgot to skip the cow song on his classical baby DVD. He loved those. And I found him standing. It always made him cry. And I found him standing in front of the television, little fists clenched. I think he was about four. Not just enthralled, but also seemingly determined not to cry. He made it through the song without shedding a tear for the first time. I can't say the same for myself when I discovered him watching it having come around the corner just a little too late. Now, as we learn sign language together, the sign for music is one that I can almost always count on him to remember. I'm going to teach it to you. This means music. Music in sign language. Now let me find my page. He has no functional verbal language yet, but he sings to himself in what sounds to me like awfully good pitch. He strums his ukulele and plays the drums. He has rhythm, and its patterns seem to organize and regulate him. He likes Justin Bieber, OK Go, Hoagy Carmichael, Ravi Shankar, Adele. He simply beams when he hears Adele, which delights me, and Mozart. And to my great relief, he tolerates and shows signs of even liking his mama singing. What he once couldn't process at all now gets him through rough spots. If he becomes frustrated or upset, I turn to music to soothe him. If I want him to pay attention to me, I sing to him. We play records in the house and practice silly dances. I often wonder what it is that he hears as he turns his head toward a tree when the wind rustles its leaves or when he notices a formation of birds flying overhead and he smiles. I suspect he hears music all around him because he stops what he's doing and he listens. My son has taught me countless lessons, but the biggest one may be that there is music in everything. I don't know what role it will ultimately play in his life, whether he will pursue it professionally or if he will just enjoy it. I only know that music might very well be his language in some way, too. What he cannot say, he might one day sing as well. So. Thank you. So I wrote down this story, too, because if I try to tell it, y'all will won't understand what I'm trying to say. I think it was four years ago that John Henry was out with one of his teachers at a park one afternoon. And for, for whatever reason, she started taking a video of him on this old squeaky glider, which she was pushing back and forth with her foot in sort of this rhythmic way. Well, John Henry found the rhythm in that glider, and he started humming over it and making up his own little song. So he would go, do, 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 over the squeak of this glider. And I thought, oh, my God, this child is suddenly finding music everywhere. So she sent me the video, and I was blown away, and the seed was planted from which a whole musical project grew. Around the same time, I noticed that John Henry had started making up his own melodies. So a few stuck, which I learned and would sing back to him to let him know I heard him, to let him know that I was participating, to let him know that he was doing something that I noticed that we could do together. A few stuck, and with the help of my collaborator and producer, Kenny Greenberg, I made a loop of the glider performance and took one of the melodies and wrote a song to it. So, now... I know that not everyone has the, just, can just, you know. I'm going to take that, and I'm going to take that, and I'm going to write a song, so I'll be back with you in about two hours. Um, that's, that's, um, this is not very graceful. Um, I understand that that's special. Can I plug this in? Okay. All right. Um, where am I? But I realize that it is our special circumstance. And the world works in mysterious ways. The world works in, in ways that we will never comprehend. But I can say that... Is this muted? Um, I can say that I am honored to be John Henry's mama, and 
being able to make music with him makes my life make sense. So this is what I wrote. And so the loop starts a song. So imagine this. Do, 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 do. Do, 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 do. It's hard to get the thought straight. One foot's in the upper head. The other legs behind me is led. So let's not borrow trouble. There's no such thing as yesterday. Tomorrow's just as far away. All we have is now. All we have is now. Do, 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 do. So I was able to let him sing in the way that he can. Do, 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 do. Let's throw our arms around it. Courage lies in our embrace of all that we don't know we face. It gets a little easier to trust what's written in the stars when we can be right where we are. All we have is now. All we is now all we have is now all we have is now and it goes on into a whole thing but I just wanted to show you I just wanted to show you that, the power of listening is so great. And I want to say this is a mama, and this is just as a mama. It has nothing to do with performing or art or anything like that. Connecting with your child in the way that he can connect is where it is. And that's the only place, or she, and that's the only place it is. And... And when we, when we have children who need help, when we have children who, for instance, like mine, has music in him, and he does not have the words to write those lyrics that he's feeling, that's my job right now until we can get him to the point where he can do it, and that's what we're working on. So it is my honor to do this. I ended up making an EP of songs with him called Wish For You. It's on all, all the things if you want to hear it. And it's quite possibly the most inspired music I've ever made. So I know that, a lang that, that music is a language for him. Just the other day, I heard him humming one of the songs in the bathtub. And he had not done that before. I heard him. I went in. I snuck in. I crouched down. I praised his performance. And I joined in. I'd hum a line. And he'd hum a line. And I'd hum a line. And he'd hum a line. And we were talking. Thank you so much for the work you do, Vanderbilt Music Cognition Center. And thank you, Lee Nash. And thank you for being here.
We're going to take a short intermission, so grab a drink, grab some food, take, uh, check out the silent auction, and we'll be back in about 10 minutes. Thanks, everybody. Okay, everyone, we're going to get started again. If everyone could take their seats. Okay, so we hope you all had fun checking out the silent auction items in the back of the hall. And we encourage you, if you like, during the beginning of our second set to head back over to those tables and take a final look to get in your last bids as our auction will be closing at 7.45 p.m. In the meantime, we can get the show moving again with our next amazing artist, Liz Longley, best known for her Stop You In Your Tracks voice. Liz is an accomplished singer-songwriter based here in Nashville. With her deeply emotional music, Longley has earned accolades from some of the most prestigious songwriting competitions in the country, including the BMI John Lennon Songwriting Scholarship Competition. The Berkeley College of Music grad worked alongside five-time Grammy-nominated producer Paul Moak on her much-awaited sixth album, Funeral for My Past. Thanks for being here, Liz, and please join me in welcoming her to the stage. Hello. My name is Liz, and I'm just so honored to be here. Um, this has been a very touching and inspiring night, and I'm just so grateful for these incredible scientists and all that they're doing, and um, thank you for being here. This is a song about loving someone through their hardest moments.
Thank you so much. I've always found music to be incredibly healing. And um, this, this song is not a story song. It's more of an invitation for you to put your story into it. It's a song about letting go of the things that you carry with you that no longer serve you. And um, this is the title track of, of the record. It's called Funeral for My Past. So if there's anything that you want to let go of today, this is, this is your invitation. And you're welcome to sing along with me if you'd like. It's very easy. I'll say, uh-huh. You'll say, hey, hey, yeah. Hey, hey, yeah. Hey, hey, yeah. Uh-huh. Hey, hey, yeah. Hey, hey, yeah. Hey, hey, yeah. I held a funeral for my past today. Laid it in the ground where it's meant to stay. With the roots, the dirt, pain, and the hurt, I had a funeral for my past today. I got down on my knees, dug up a mighty grave, made room for all the darkness, the anger, and the shame. So deep, it never haunts me. Trying to fight it, my demons always won. Till I stop fighting, till I let the Lord in. Oh, and I could not help but tremble. I could not help but cry. There was something holy about it. Just watching. Thank you all so much. Okay, it's going to be a very tough act to follow. <laughs> Um, but I am very excited to share with you a little bit about our research. So changing gears a tiny bit here. Um, 
As you know, I co-direct the Music Cognition Lab with the amazing Miriam Lenz. I'm Raina Gordon. And what this co-direction means is on a daily basis that we get to dream up and oversee new research that connects our human musical behaviors to our brains. And I get to work with the wonderful students and staff and faculty in the lab to design and carry out studies that demonstrate to the biomedical community how deep music goes into our biology. I'm very fortunate to be part of many communities at Vanderbilt that support this work, so that long list of secondary affiliations is not an accident. And actually, my interest in music has been lifelong, even predating my interest in science. So I am also a trained vocalist with a bachelor's in music from the University of Southern California, and I've always been interested in how humans communicate using music. I went to graduate school for neuroscience, and then I got into genetics research while on the faculty here. So that's me learning genetics. Um, and so I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about that today. So I wanna give you a window into how my group in the lab is starting to unravel mysteries about the biology of human musicality. We've already seen today from the wonderful work of Miriam's group on singing and social connection that music plays a key role in our social engagement and our emotional health. Let's think about why that would be. Well, music brings us together, but music is also something that each of us experiences a little bit differently. Why is that? Well, our brains are each a little bit different, and our genomes are one source of that similarity and those differences across humans. So let's nerd out together for a moment. Okay, next. All right. So human rhythm is a key part of human music making, and we're trying to understand what the biology is that helps us know how to do this. So I'm really excited to share with you about our recent genome-wide study of synchronizing with a musical beat. So this paper was featured on the September 22 2022 cover of the journal Nature Human Behavior. And as an aside, as another cool way that our science intersects with the arts was that I got to work on this cover art with artist Martha Lewis and she took my very vague vision and made it into a lovely portrayal of dancing DNA. So a shout out to Martha. So this study was uh, the first large scale genome study of any musical trait. And we actually found almost 70 regions of the genome that were linked to people's ability to synchronize to a musical beat. So what we were all just doing, we were singing in synchrony, we were tapping, clapping, all of that is what we're studying in the lab and we're trying to understand how it is that we're able to do this. Okay, and the results of this study re revealed that there's not just one gene for rhythm, there are many genes for rhythm. And by pinpointing these specific genetic markers, these specific places on genes on the genome, then we've opened up new avenues of research to understanding how these genes influence rhythm skills. Next. We found that genes linked to rhythm tend to be genes involved in brain development and function. So our genes give us give instructions to our brains while the brain is developing and throughout the lifespan. And these instructions help the brain to wire itself to want to make music, to want to synchronize with a musical beat, to want to sing, to want to listen to music on the radio, to go to concerts, and to make music with our kids. So again, music is what brings us together as a society, and there are also all these differences in the way each of us experience music, and those forces of similarity and differences then actually become the fuel for our scientific discovery. Next. I'm also very passionate about the way we do this research to make sure that it's ethically and socially responsible. So we're taking great care to create and use a framework for a responsible research life cycle in musicality genetics. And this means being as inclusive as possible in our study design, using really robust analysis methods. I'm nerding out again. Um, being specific about proper use and misuse of genetic results and taking care when communicating results to the broader community. For instance, genetics are just part of the story, so our genes are not the only thing that defines us. Musical environments also matter, environments in general also matter. And we actually just published an ethics piece this year to establish some guidelines for the field to be thinking about these important aspects of the research. Next. So I hope that I've been able to show you briefly why and how human beings are musical beings. 
and the subtle similarities and differences in our genomes that help make our brains musical. There's so much more that we need to, to do to study to actually keep unraveling these mysteries. So we're, we're really at the very beginning of this work, but so far it's promising. Next. I am incredibly grateful to our research participants, our research team, our collaborators, and our funders. And I want to thank you all for your attention. And then I, I'm going to introduce a brief, or I am introducing a brief video message from one of my former students, Dr. Alexander Chern. So we're very proud of Dr. Chern and all he has already accomplished as a budding surgeon scientist and musician scientist. And we know that there, he has a lot of um, great work to continue to do. So we're going to hear from him now. Hi, my name is Alex Chern. I'm currently an otolaryngology resident physician at New York Presbyterian Hospital, Columbia and Weill Cornell. The Music Cognition Lab in the Vanderbilt Otolaryngology Department has a very special place in my heart. When I was a medical student at Vanderbilt, I was hit by a car and hospitalized for a month. During my recovery, music was very therapeutic for me. I listened to a lot of music and I also began playing the violin again, something I spent a lot of time doing when I was younger but stopped during medical school. After my accident, I spent a lot of time working very closely with Dr. Raina Gordon in the Music Cognition Lab, where I had the great fortune to obtain top-tier research training and uh, work with outstanding scientists. The Music Cognition Lab really helped me rediscover my love for music and showed me that I could combine my passion for music and medicine. In fact, I still conduct music cognition research while in residency today. I hope to continue this journey as I start my fellowship in otology, neurotology, and skull-based surgery in July and begin my career as a surgeon scientist examining music perception and enjoyment in individuals with hearing loss. Now here's a little Bach for you. turn our attention back to the Mindful Songwriting Project to hear some more original songs. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce Sarah Beck, who has a special relationship with the Music Cognition Lab. Sarah is a singer, songwriter, poet, and an assistant professor of psychology. She got her PhD from Vanderbilt University, where she worked with Miriam Lentz on research related to parent-child musical interaction and children's musical play. She currently lives in the foothills of the Blue Ridge Mountains of Virginia and teaches at Randolph College. Her musical output spans two decades and eight albums, with highlights including singing the theme song of Kevin Costner's Emmy-winning miniseries, Hatfields and McCoys, and multiple appearances with the legendary artist Stevie Wonder. Her poetry has appeared in Rattle, Litmosphere, Mother Magazine, and Sunlight Press. Beck continues to collaborate on research and content with Dr. Lentz at the Music Cognition Lab at Vanderbilt University, as well as release new music. We are thrilled Sarah is here today, so please join me in welcoming Sarah Beck. I, uh, thank you, Zoe. That was wonderful. I don't, I don't know if I really have anything to add to that. <laughs> That's quite comprehensive. Um, I, I have the joy and honor of, of performing a couple of songs that were written as part of the Mindfulness Songwriting Project. Um, and we're going to have introductions from both of the songwriters, uh, the family members, uh, the, the parents in the study, the, the parent participants. And the first one will be by video, and then I'll play a song, and then we'll see another one in person, I believe, and then I'll do one more song. So I'll turn it over to the video.
Hello, my name is Elizabeth Ronimus, and I'm from Lakewood, Washington. I have a seven-year-old that is on the autism spectrum, and that's what got me into the program. I was struggling with being fully present. I was kind of stuck in the past and future tripping, um, and just kind of needed something to help me be mindful and more here. Um, I wrote a song called Your World um, and it was about kind of the grieving process um, of the autism diagnosis um, but also my daughter was supposed to be a twin and that's kind of where the end of the song plays in the you're never alone um is for her and her twin. Um, I just want to say thank you for having this program. It is very, very healing for the parents. So, thank you for listening to my song, and thank, just thank you. <laughs> I'm a mom also, and uh, it's... I feel like these are all of our concerns and all of our stories, and it's so meaningful to hear, to be here and be a part of this. This is called Your World. You remind me, you remind me, you remind me of joy. I see you, I see you, I see bubbles, I see twirls, I see freckles, I see curls, I'm so glad to be part of your world. so excited we have I, I I met this wonderful mom just tonight and I'm so pleased to welcome Becca to talk about her song before I get to play it hi. hi guys okay I'm having a little bit of a surreal moment because I'm having two of my songs played and the sorry oh, oh, no. oh it's fine okay that's fine this is on par with my life okay <laughs> So, Sorry, Mike. <laughs> you're fine. I'm just, oh my gosh. Okay, mediocre is something my world is not. My world is filled with more ups and downs than a roller coaster, like many of the parents in this room um, can totally relate to. Um, when things seem to settle down, I'll get a phone call. That leaves me thinking, oh, that's an interesting plot twist. I was not expecting that um, for like a couple more chapters. Um, <laughs> 
It's like, okay, not ready, but here we are. Um, it was shortly after one of these turns, the one where in the middle of the great panini, um, as we like to call it at my house, uh, my husband came home and said, hey, honey, do you want to buy the family farm with me? I replied, if I can have chickens, most certainly I do. And <laughs> he said, excellent, I already told the ants we would. <laughs> so I was like, okay, fine, that's awesome. Um, so now we're in Portland, Tennessee. Um, but anyway, during this move is when I received the email about the songwriting and music therapy study. I didn't really understand what it was, but I had done um, several studies, Serenade. I forgot about the eye tracking one. And we did some others, like there's a toothbrushing one and a robot one. I totally forgot to introduce myself. Hi, I'm Becca Doris, and I'm a mom of three neurospicy children, all three on the autism spectrum. <laughs> My middle one also has ADHD diagnosed. We think the older one also has that as well as a couple other things. And I'm in the process of getting my diagnoses, which is why I'm trying to stick to the script because, yes, it's very difficult for me. Um, <laughs> so um, when I was told that it was just for parents, I was even more thrilled. I was having a really hard time. Um, I had to take my middle son out of school during his kindergarten year before uh, the pandemic happened uh, due to a lot of behavioral issues and other things. So we were already homeschooling and then I had the other two. My youngest um, at that point was mostly nonverbal. Um, Serenade really helped us connect um, and help open him up. Okay, I'm not gonna cry yet. Um, <laughs> so this program, these people have already met much to me and my family. <laughs> oh my gosh, sorry. Um, I'm constantly overwhelmed with everything I need to do to keep my family out of survival mode. To be able to focus on my self-care and not have to pay for it was a huge blessing, um, not just for me, but for my family. We live on um, a single income. My husband's a teacher and math teacher, and he's also a musician, um, but that's more of a hobby. But shameless plug, if you want to support us, I wrote a poetry book. It's on Kindle Unlimited. Um, it's called Adorable Poetry Edition, Muses and Fuses by Becca Bilbo Doris. And yes, Bilbo was my maiden name, Bilbo as in Baggins. Um, and that's <laughs> Doris with two R's. Um, that would really be awesome. You don't actually have to read it, you can just order it. Um, <laughs> you know, use those uh, uh, delayed shipping credits. It's amazing. Um, <laughs> if I ever get my act together, I'm also gonna finish another book, but it's fine. My editor's not too mad at me. Um, <laughs> this program helped me carve out time for my mental health. I continue to use a lot of the mindfulness programs, uh, techniques that I learned, um, even taught myself how to play guitar um, with the help of my wonderful Kate. She is my, I hired her. She is my music therapist. I see her monthly now. Um, I can't, I, I even, she's in one of my poems. Um, and anyway, but <clears throat> uh, with the help of her and my husband, um, we've, uh, I've really been able to use a lot of these mu musicality and influence and um, which makes sense because my husband's not only a Nashville native, but his father-in-law is in the music business and he's a math teacher and because math teaching and guitar playing go hand in hand. Um, so <laughs> anywho, it's fine. Uh, during this study, I wrote two songs. Uh, the first, Because of You, is a love, love song for my boys. Their personalities, their interests, and the way they see the world um, has taught me so much about the perception of life's true little wonders. For instance, my youngest Daniel, when it talks about raining, um, when he was about 10 months old and he was already walking, figured out how to open the back door, ran outside, completely stripped just so he could be in the rain and feel it. And I have never seen so much joy on a child. Um, <laughs> and so each, each boy is a color. Red is for my son Micah, he's 12, and now um, like three inches taller than me. It's not fair. And then my middle son is Sam, he's nine. Um, he is the blue coloring in, in that song, and then I believe Daniel's green. Um, and then I'm still having a little bit of a surreal moment because when I was writing Remind Me with um, Kate, um, I told her, I was like, you know, I really, I hear it as like Brandi Carlisle or um, Cheryl Crow or like singing together or like Lee Nash, like really, like I just feel this. And so 
when I was putting this all together that it was that Lee Nash that's actually singing my song. I'm sorry, sorry. Like I'm just a little bit extra overwhelmed and then everybody here was amazing and everything resonates with me. Um, but anyway, that song is just that, a reminder to love myself, to breathe, to be mindful that these moments, both terrible and terribly wonderful, are just that, moments that will pass, that I will survive the tough ones and cherish the peaceful ones, um, to remind me to not get lost in caring for those I love. Um, since this study, we've encountered some of our most challenging parental and family moments, including the last couple of weeks. Um, I don't know how I would have handled the situations without the support this therapy study has brought me, um, but I know because of it, I trusted myself and my intuition and was able to get my boys the help that they needed without completely breaking down myself. Um, while we still towed the survival mode line, um, I've been able to enjoy the thriving moments more as well, and I am still having a surreal moment. I'm so excited, so thank you. <laughs> When you came into my world You stole my soul And wrapped me around your finger mm -hmm. You turned my life Upside down with your ferocious love mm -hmm. The grass is greener The sky is even bluer The sunset glows redder Wherever you are, everything's brighter it's better because of you, because of you. Like the wind that blows the bird higher and higher, you inspire others to soar. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When the water, the rain crashes down You only wish to get wetter When you feel the sun warm your skin You only wish for more The grass is green It's better because of you. It's better 
Because of you. Because of you. I can see some people are already doing this. Can you guys sing with me? So here's your part. Because of you. Because of you. If you want something harder, keep going. You. Stop playing, but keep going. Ready? You, 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 you. Because of 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 you. Y'all are beautiful. Thank you so much. Becca, Kate, thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah. Thank you so much, Becca. Um, if you have been texted that you want a silent auction item, you can pick them up at the end of the show in the back. And it is my great pleasure to invite back to the stage Lee Nash. Thank you. Please welcome, join me in welcoming her back to the stage. I don't know why I can't do that. Hey guys. Uh, I'm glad you're still here. Um, I'm going to do, uh, do a song real quick. Um, yeah, okay, I'll do this. This is a song that um, Becca and Kate wrote t uh, together, um, and it is so beautiful. We've been working on it. Here, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll get this where we can all see it. Hold okay. on. Uh, this may be a train wreck, so please enjoy. I could just hold it. How about that? You can see from here. That's good. We can see it. You can? Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. My boobs get in the way. <laughs> All right. Um, this is called Remind Me and Forgive Me <laughs> if, if uh, I mess it up. But these ladies won't. I'm pretty sure of that. Okay. Tom, are you back there? I'm not back here. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. We're ready. Remind me to be more than this Remind me of a summer's kiss Remind me to love myself And sing my song All night long Remind me Rewind me Untie Remind me of the soft dreams, bliss. Remind me of the things I'd miss. Remind me that I'll be okay. And it won't always be this way. Remind me, rewind. Remind me I try so hard, I deserve a break. Remind me I'm so strong, it's not a piece of cake. 
Remind me to dream out loud To just forget the crowd To play with me Create with me Just love me Just be me Remind me Remind me We should probably just end with that. I, yeah, is that good? Do you, okay, I can do another song a bit. Are y'all tired of this? Okay, I could just do, we were gonna end with that because what a number that is. <laughs> they wrote that and it's absolutely spectacular. What a beautiful song. So thanks for, um, thank you. Uh, I, all right, um, I'll do one song if you don't mind. Um, I wrote this uh, song a few years ago after visiting an agricultural center with my friend where the police train their horses. And um, so I got a little bit of therapy myself that day because uh, a, a man came out of the barn and it was winter time. And so he was wearing a coat and you couldn't immediately see that he was a prisoner there. And he explained to us, um, his path and why he was in jail and that on good behavior he, he gets to work with the horses. So by the time I got back to the car with my friend, I kind of I had the chorus going, going and I, I finished it with uh, Connie Harrington later and um, I got to sing it with Vince Gill um, and that was kind of a big deal uh, for me. So anyway, here's this very special song um, inspired by you know, this man named Dwayne that hasn't heard the song yet, which is uh, a shame, but he'll hear it. <laughs> he said, I've been locked up 14 months on misdemeanor charges. I got clean in county jail, but the loneliest is the hardest. As long as I'm on good behavior, they let me work these stables. And I never prayed a day in my life, but now I'm finally able. Sometimes you don't know what you need until you get it. And I didn't know what you asked for, so I didn't. I'd just brush them and I'd feed them And the holes in my arms started healing Oh, it's like they knew what I was feeling The state gave me 18 months But God gave me horses He said it's funny how here I thought I was taking care of them They know my voice come when I call Yeah, these are my best friends Hadn't seen my father in seven years Too ashamed of what I was When he visits me on Sundays now He's proud to call me son Sometimes you don't know what you need until you get it. I didn't know what to ask for, so I didn't. I just brush them and I'd feed them. And the holes in my arms started healing. Oh, it's like they knew what I was feeling. Gave me 18 months. God gave me horses. I've driven by a million times, but I stopped today and leaned against that fence to clear my head. 
When a stranger in his prison blues handed me the reins And somehow I felt freer when I left Sometimes you don't know what you need until you get it I didn't know what you asked for, so I didn't. I just brush them and I'd feed them. And the holes in my arms started healing. Oh, it's like they knew what I was feeling. The state gave me 18 months. The state gave me 18 months. But God gave me horses. Thank you so much for having me. You guys are amazing. I want to thank you all for being here tonight. Um, let's give a big round of applause of thanks to all the artists for the incredible performances and all the families for sharing their stories and the incredible members of this lab. I also want to thank Brian and everybody here at Wyatt Rotunda for hosting us today. So woo, let's give a shout out to them. And of course, oh, <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, but really, truly, this work is so meaningful, and we're, we're just so grateful for all of you for your support. So stick around. We all want to say hi and um, gather your silent auction items. And as I said at the beginning, this is just the beginning. We hope to continue this conversation. So thank you.